Mr. Siam, thank you very much for being part of Inside Leather History at Fireside Chat. Well, thank you for having me. This is really exciting. Great. So when we were preparing for this chat, you said about the Christian Jorgensen story that that was actually your story. For the benefit of the audience, would you explain who Christian Jorgensen was and, and why this story so relates to you? Well, uh, let me preface a little bit by saying that uh, when I was young, my family, we used to go to drive-in movies. They kind of a ritual like once or twice a month. And um, one night, we uh, decided to go to this movie, and they used to have double features back then. So the second movie that was in the feature was called The Christine Jorgensen Story. And I was, you know, younger, and I remember my age, but it was about um, a person who went through transsexual surgery in Denmark, you know, successful transsexual surgery. And I remember seeing that movie, and it resonated with me. It had, that I felt that like that was my story. It was the first inclination I had that I was different in how. But it scared the crap out of me, actually, because there wasn't anything that I'd seen or heard of back then. There was no reference. All that I could see is, is this movie about this person that I felt I could identify with. So that's, that's kind of the, the story behind that one. Well, why did it register so strongly with you? What was going on with you internally, emotionally, with that? Actually, there wasn't anything at the time. It was um, it was just something that I identified with. I was actually too young. It was very prepubescent, so I was not dealing with any kind of sexuality or anything. But I think, and I believe that uh, gender is not something that you are it's socially influenced by. It's something. It's how you're wired. And I think that was an indication to me about how I was wired. Now, how it affected me a little bit later is a different story. Because it scared me, I pretty much kind of went into denial about it uh, for the rest of my life, or the rest of my life, but for a large part of my life. Let's take a bit of a step back. Please tell us a little bit about your early life, your family, where you're from. OK, well, I was born in uh, New Orleans. And uh, my mom was uh, originally from Belfast, Ireland. Uh, my dad was born in New Orleans, so both my family was overseas or in New Orleans. And that um, my mom was not a very healthy person. Um, I was the fourth child being born, but the first one that survived. I had uh, two uh, sisters and a brother that didn't survive uh, with miscarriages. And I had a 50-50 chance. I had asthma and stuff. And uh, we... Uh, when I was about seven years old, the doctors had told uh, my parents that the climate, like out in California, would be much better for me and would be a, um, a, little, a little bit better for my health. So my dad um, went ahead and uh, made arrangements with the company he was working for to get transferred out here to Los Angeles. So we moved out here and um, we lived actually not too far from here for the first year. And then my dad bought a house in uh, Covina, which is about 30 miles uh, east of here. And that's where I pretty much grew up. And my family life was pretty normal. I had a, a younger brother as well, by four years. And we had a pretty tight family, but my dad had, uh, after buying the house, had to work a lot of overtime to make sure he could pay the bills, pay the mortgage, and stuff. And my mom, who had not been healthy, was uh, diabetic, she had glaucoma, she had bad liver, um, she was dealing with a lot of medical pain. And the added stress of uh, my dad working a lot and things and her health, she started drinking. And unfortunately, she became an alcoholic. And it was, uh, I mean, I had a really great childhood that I was never mistreated really. I was never, uh, I mean, we had a good family life, but when my mom would drink, she was not a nice person. So she would be verbally um, abusive to my father. And my dad had the patience of a saint. So, you know, growing up, I got to witness a lot of different dynamics about, um, uh, about the 
behavior and about self-control and about addiction, which influenced me a lot of me in my later life about how I, I grew up. But they were also teachers, and they taught me a lot of lessons about, um, you know, for example, uh, I was taught to question things, not to believe everything you, you hear. I was told that the only thing I was given when I came into this world uh, was uh, time, and that how I used it was my choice, but once, but to realize that once it ran out, there was no more, and no matter how much money or how successful you could be, when your time comes, it comes. And you're never gonna know if it's the next day or in 70 years, so you could use time wisely. So I pretty much kept those with it, but there's nothing spectacular or un unusual um, other than kind of living my kind of secret life inside as a, um, uh, to myself. But taking a step back to your family, you, you said that you learned a lot of life lessons and you learned a lot about people and a lot about life. What are some of the main points you took from that? What sorts of things did your parents teach you about people and life and things? Well, <clears throat> born in the South, uh, it was all about manners. And, um, and that was very important. You know, my mom had, you know, the, a lot of the um, ideals from Ireland and, you know, Europe and stuff about behavior. Um, I was never spanked. Uh, discipline to, to my parents was uh, maybe sending me my, to my room and then explaining to me why it was wrong with what I did if I got in trouble. It wasn't about necessary punishment. Um, it was about, you need to know what you did wrong so that you can correct it. You know, people can say they're sorry all they want, but it's their actions that matter. And I was pretty much brought up to say that, um, which I kind of modified a little bit in later years, but I tell people, you know, that we all fuck up. We all make mistakes with what you do afterward that defines who you are and your character. And that was one of the lessons I learned early on too, is that um, you know, don't be afraid of failure, don't be afraid of being wrong, it doesn't make you a bad person, uh, and to use any kind of failure as a lesson, a lesson to be better in life, a lesson to uh, improve on yourself, or even a lesson that you can learn by somebody else's behavior, sometimes not what to do, but what not to do. Coming back to your to your younger years, you, you said that uh, you really enjoyed Batman and Catwoman. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that. Well, I grew up in, uh, well, I'll be 65 in next, next week, actually. You know, so I grew up when uh, the Batman series was in regular rotation every week, and it was always a two two part show. And at the end of the at the end of the first episode, they were always captured by the villain. So it was always some kind of predicament on it. It was never that they were going to, you know, shoot him or do anything like that. They had him tied up and swinging over a pendulum or, or some kind of silly thing like that. But to me, the, the bondage was exciting. <laughs> I enjoyed it at that. It was like, wow, that's really cool. And as far as Captain when he goes, that's, you know, kind of self-explanatory. I kind of identified with that character, thought she was hot. But, you know, if I had to be anybody in that show, that's the one that I would want to be. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it was probably my first beginning to realize that I had a kink, okay? Rather than anything uh, sexual or gender-wise, it was, all I knew is that that stuff at the end of the first episode, with them getting tied up and being in predicament bondage and stuff, was always the exciting part for me. Did you have any idea of the implications of this? No. But I do know that when I when I played with my brothers and his friends and stuff, that um, you know, if it was cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers or whatever, I, I had a lot of joy in doing <laughs> doing the capturing and tying them up or being captured and being tied up. So, um, and as I started to get a little bit older, then I started experimenting in my room, you know, at night after bedtime and ready to sleep, you know, get some rope and tie ankles or wrists or do something, you know. I knew it was, it was really exciting. And I was still too young to, um, you know, to get sexually aroused. 
But eventually that happened. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for many years, you harbored a secret inside. What was your secret? Why were you keeping that secret? Well, again, it, it went back to that self-identification with transgender. Um, I knew that it was different. I was, was somewhat, basically in denial publicly, but inside I knew there was something. Uh, I knew how I felt. Uh, I knew what, what was comfortable to me as far as my identity towards other boys and girls. Um, and when I started going to a library, uh, the only thing I could find in that library was things that about it being a mental illness, okay? Homosexuality, uh, transsexualism, all those things were, were um, medically and psychologically bad. And then, to complicate it, starting to, I started to realize the key part of my life when I would look into those kind of things, then that wasn't necessarily the same kind of sickness, but it was, it, it was considered a perversion. Okay, it would sound as bad to me too. <laughs> So it's like, oh my God, everything that I'm into, the world is against. Everything that I'm into is bad. I'm, you know, I'm this thing that nobody wants is accepting of. I'm, if I tell somebody, they're going to think I'm sick. You know, I'm, I'm mentally ill. I'm psychologically uh, not okay. And I didn't think so. I thought I was just fine. <laughs> but um, it was something that I was not about to disclose. The, uh, so I pretty much, at that point in my life, I started getting involved in sports because the asthma that, that had cleared up pretty much. And uh, so I used my participation in sports to become an overachiever and to um, kind of hide the fact of who I was. And it wasn't until later in life when I went to therapy that I realized that what I was doing is I was living my life to be the person I thought other people wanted me to be. Because I was afraid they wouldn't accept me for what I was. So, you know, I excelled in basketball, I excelled in, in baseball. I, when I first started running in high school, my first uh, two-mile race in cross-country stuck. I remember it was like 13 minutes and 44 seconds. But I worked really hard, because that was my, my ethic uh, growing up and my parents taught me is 110%. And I worked and worked and worked. And by the time I was a junior, um, I had the fastest time in the league. I was going to state finals. And also, it was really good because I had this letterman's jacket. And I had more medals than anybody in the school. And I could be that macho person, that, that jock. And, um, and thinking that nobody will know about me then. And at that point, I still wasn't sure whether I was straight or gay because I didn't. You know, I, I identified more with being female than, than dating a female, okay? I mean, not that I, was, I didn't feel that I was totally gay, because I was very confused, because I, I liked girls, and I liked being with them, but I didn't really picture myself sexually and acting that active with them. So that was pretty much my secret for a long, long time. Um, and it wasn't until later in years with some publications like Pen Health Variations, and forum and things that people would have the letters that they would describe some of their their activity. That I realized that there's more people in the world that I'm not the only one, and I may not be that bad person that I read the medical books and anything I gave my hands on. But when you were reading these, you were learning that it was viewed as something bad. What did that evoke for you? Did you did you feel the a need to suppress it even more? Did this cause difficulty? It had to be very confusing. Oh, extremely. I mean, I, uh, you have self-doubts, and I think that's why I tended to overcompensate in things. You know, whatever I did, if it was schoolwork, I, I did good to me, to try to be the best in the class. If it was sports, I wanted to be the one that was going to win. Um, and it wasn't only to, uh, ex to feel accepted or to fool everybody. It was also something that I thought that I needed to do for acceptance. I wanted, 
I was afraid, and it wasn't even conscious at that time, it was subconscious, that I wanted my parents to be proud of me. I wanted people to, to look at me and respect me for my achievements because if they really knew what was inside, then they would associate it with, with mental illness and, and stuff. And having three siblings that didn't make it, I felt kind of almost pressured to be the, the person that, I wanted to be the person that my parents wanted me to be. I mean, like all parents do, they want your, your children to be successful and stuff. And in my mind, I was already, I already had two strikes against me. It's feeling like I was transgender and kinky, and all these things are telling me that these are abnormal. So I thought, you know, inside you're you're, you're telling yourself, you know, I, you know, I'm the pride and joy. I'm the first one that that lives, and now I'm I'm flawed. I'm sick. I'm abnormal. You know, uh, those are pretty intense. But fortunately, because my family was supportive and I had a good family that I could say that I was lucky enough to never go through a, a suicidal part of it. I never put myself in a situation where I wanted to die. I felt that I was happy in life. I had a secret. I could live with that secret. Nobody needed to know. It wasn't affecting me outward, outwardly, only inwardly. Did you ever uh, try to explore that side of yourself at all as a, as a young person? Did you simply ignore it and, and pursue your other achievements? Or did you ever explore that? As young, I, I did not explore it after reading those books. Uh, I think there was a part of me that didn't want to know more. Everything, and, I, and actually, you know, you, back in those days there was no internet or anything. So you went to the library and you looked at the card, card catalog for things. And I literally looked up everything I could in that library on uh, on uh, transsexualism, transvestism, uh, you name it. And you know, literally, it was like three or four references. So I felt that I went through everything I could in the library, and there was nothing positive about it. So at that point, it was kind of, you know, do I really want to know more? How do I know more? I've already looked and read everything I can read, and all these medical books and psychological books from there. But I can't, I don't want to tell my family. And I sure as hell don't want to go tell a doctor because they're the ones that's, that's writing this, telling me that I'm bad, you know, I'm sick and I'm, I'm perverted and, and I'm abnormal. So it was like, this is something I'm just going to deal with and I will find another outlet. And that other outlet was something that was going to make me happy, that would keep my focus uh, externally rather than internally. So you followed convention and you got married, you had three children. Tell us your thoughts on that. Have you any regrets about that time in your life? Oh, no. I mean, when I got married, it was because I was in love. And, you know, and then uh, by the time I got married, I had already started. Let's let me back up a little, just a little bit. Um, when I was old enough to go into an adult bookstore, okay, I went into the a store and I saw publications about this. And all of a sudden, that's when I felt that I'm not alone. There, there are more people like me. And maybe it's not that bad. You know, so then they had books like, um, oh God, uh, Everything You Want to Know About Sex, that had like five pages on bondage and s and and so, but that was a book that was not negative. Yeah. That was a book about the people in general. So I bought that book and I read it and, now, and those thoughts about being sick and perverted were starting to fade away. And then maybe that, the people that wrote those books didn't understand. So by the time I got married, I'd already learned a little bit more about that there was kink out there. I was starting to explore that kink. Um, uh, through publications and uh, and reading you know, different magazines and books. So when I got married, I kind of at that point thought that when I was was bisexual and that I was a 
across the chest. Or, so I still had to come to terms with being transsexual. So I thought, oh, I, I can, I, I'm in love. Uh, I'm enjoying sex. You know, I don't. I'm still attracted to men, but I love women, and I'm having sex with women, and it's really good, and I'm having fun with it. And I met a woman that I'm in love with, and we have kids, and I wouldn't change that for the world. My uh, my first son was born to Sarah. My second one was uh, born in a birth center. My daughter was born at home oh in God. our bedroom. Like how I deliver. So um, was that intentional? Yes, yes, we had planned it, and um, we had a midwife, and then uh, you know it helped having help. Uh, give birth to my daughter and hold her, you know, right there in our bedroom and stuff is something that I would not trade for the world. It was, um, so I have no regrets. And, um, and probably the only regret that I would say that I have right now is that, um, and it's a little bit off, but you know, with my father, when my mom died when she was uh, 46 from cirrhosis because of her drinking. My dad lived through his 70. And um, I weighed back and forth for a number of years to tell him about me, and I never did. And we, I guess we can maybe talk about that after, but um, I think he knew, and I think he was trying to let me know he knew, but I was too, so too afraid to say something. But uh, yeah, with my family, my, my kids, and I raised them to be open-minded. Um, my son's very accepting of my lifestyle, my uh, my gender change. My daughter works with me here at Sanctuary as uh, uh, as one of my directors on board of directors and uh, as operations and CFO. Uh, I'm blessed when it comes to family, my family. Did your ex-wife know about this? <laughs> Um, that's an interesting one, okay, because when I kind of broke it to her with that, the, everything you want to know about sex book, <laughs> especially paying attention to the, uh, to the king part and the cross-dressing part. So we started experimenting and playing with it, and we had a good time with it, and she was fine with it, and, um, you know, because it was spiced everything up, okay. I still was not honest about my inner feelings, but again, there was still part of me in denial on it and then I said I thought that it might be bisexual but now kinky it's okay. You know? And I had someone in my life that I could share that with and we could we could, you know, play with bondage and things and um, explore. Okay. Do you still enjoy a good relationship with her? Yes, we've been um I uh, got divorced in two thousand seven with her. Um, we're still friends. Uh, I'm currently married. You know, I got married to someone I've known. I know now for 13 years and developed through our DS and um, evolved into more and got married in uh, 2017 and very happy. And my my ex is friends with her. Um, my ex is also married, so everybody still gets together on uh, on the holidays. Uh, both families. Is, uh, what bonds us together still is the fact of um, you know my children, yeah. which are all grown. You know my oldest one will be 41 this year, and my youngest one is um, will be 34. Okay. Tell us about your coming out. How did this evolve for you to finally be who you were inside? Okay, um, a couple different paths. It took a little while, but <clears throat> originally when I came out of college, I went into the corporate world. And, um, and so, so I had a, kind of a corporate background, but the company I was with was going to be moving to North Carolina, and I didn't want to go. And at that job, I was the director of operations, and uh, some of the people that worked there were in the music business. I got to uh, meet musicians and producers and uh, stage managers. And the, uh, so I got involved in the, and I'd always loved music. Couldn't play it, but always loved it. So uh, 
I got some emails because I started working with these bands and helping them out and, and things. And um, so when the company decided to move, I decided to work, get involved in the music industry. And I started working on putting on, putting on small concerts and rock and roll shows. Uh, and doing that gave me a couple of things in life. It, I was happy doing it. Um, I could dress and be how I wanted. And since this was kind of in the days of heavy metal, you know, I could wear leather, I could take and uh, wear, I was very, I went very androgynous. I was, had the uh, eye makeup, black fingernails, um, very tight pants, androgynous clothes, leather jacket. And um, when, uh, when I came out to the, to the community, to the world, so to speak, um, I thought, I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid that the people who I worked with was going to have a problem, the bands that I managed was going to have a problem, my friends were going to have a problem. Um, but it was just the opposite. When I told everybody, because I transitioned the way I did kind of gradually, it wasn't shock value. It was more like, oh, that, now it makes sense. We didn't know if you were kind of in a glam goth scene or whether you were gay or we didn't know. But now it answers questions and everyone accepted it. And I learned later on from the therapist, my therapist, that it's when people have a problem with their transition sometimes, it's because they show up one day in a three-piece suit and the next day in a dress. Yeah. And people have, you know, you're dealing with maybe your whole life with other people in your life it's all of a sudden why opening and it takes a little time to deal with it and adjust to that. Now, when that was my coming out publicly, a little bit earlier than that, I had already transitioned. And, and early in my transition, I had my male outside life and female inside life. When I went to do myself with work in the music business, I was I was back. And when I was in, uh, in my real mode, I identified as Katie. So um, my, um, after my divorce, which didn't go smoothly, because um, when I did kind of branch this to my, my ex who I was married to at the time, about what I was into, and I thought that it might be a little bit more than that, she came across very accepting. And she started doing some research, and I think she it scared her. I think she thought she was losing her husband, and uh, we had a serious conversation about she didn't want to be involved in this anymore. And so I purged, and I put, I packed everything up, all my clothing, and stuck up and in the closet. And she was very cold for a while, and she finally told me that she was upset because I didn't throw it away, that it was still there. So. It means that it wasn't out of my life. And that was the beginning of our separation. And as our separation went a little farther, it got a little uglier. And uh, she had moved away up north and wouldn't let me know where my kids were. And, uh, and so it was very traumatic. And my son had an accident in school. Um, and they had taken him to the hospital. And then unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, she had had my kids with her father, and she had a problem with uh, getting to see him, so she contacted me. And I went up there and we reconnected, and I came back to LA, I was transitioning, and I got a call one day that my kids, my son and my daughter wanted to come down instead to break break with me. And here I was transitioning, in fact, I can't hide what I'm doing now. So I took and wrote a letter, snail mail, still then, and uh, explained everything about my transition. And my thoughts were that I was going to be, I was going to receive something back saying, you know what, the kids aren't coming down there, stay out of our mind, and so on. And I got a call a few days later, which terrified me. And she said, I got your letter, and I'm really happy for you. I'm, um, I'm glad you realized that 
you kind of known for 10 years you were going to do this, and I'm glad that you finally came around to it. And then said, okay, wow, right? I'm sorry, who called you? My ex. Oh, okay. Right. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, well, how do you feel about with the kids? You're probably fine with the venue, too. <laughs> so I thought it was the last one to know, I think. <laughs> and uh, so my kids came down, and they spent a great break with me. And then my son went back up north. My daughter lived with me the rest of the year. Went to school. Things got better. This was in the 90s. My ex came down. We tried to put it together again in 2000. Um, we're good until about 2006, but we grew apart. Not necessarily in a bad way. So my transition's been a kind of different aspects of things. But I have to say that, again, um, the toughest part of that my transition was myself accepting it. Because I was so concerned about what other people were going to think, what other people were going to do, and who I was going to lose in my life. And my therapist, who was gay, who told me that when it, before I started to come out, he said, you're living your life for, you're, you're trying to be the person that everybody wants you to be, rather than the person who you are, because you're afraid that they're not gonna like who you are. And I found out that when I transitioned, and did come out, the friends, some of the ones I thought were gonna reject me the most, it embraced me the most, and it said to me, we're your friends because of who you are, not what you look like, but what's in, it's the inside still the same. So you may look different, but we're fine with it. If anybody fucks with you, let us know and we'll kick their ass. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the loss of relationships a, a major problem, a major hurdle for people who transition? I, th I think so. I think, you know, and again, I think we're our own worst enemy because we fear rejection. Um, and I, you know, now in 2019, as open as things are, there is still that. And, and there's still a danger of uh, rejection. I mean, I know people now who uh, are afraid to come out to their family, or who have come out to their family, and they're disowned. Uh, they're made to feel that, you know, they're, they're sick, and that God is against them, and they're uh, nothing but a, a mistake, or an invitation. I mean, I've even heard people who are Christian say things like, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the one good thing about abortion. And I mean, how can you say that to somebody and let somebody feel good about themselves? And I think it's, it's that fear of rejection and then the reinforcement of rejection which causes so many suicides. Yeah. Uh, I, we, we often hear of suicide being a major issue with people who transition, uh, what, what do you feel you had that other people didn't that, that prevented you from going down that road? I think I had a, I had a, a healthy upbringing. I think um, I was brought up with, about morals and, uh, and being proud. Uh, like I said, I don't, I, I won't, I don't think question whether that movie with Christine Jorgensen was an accident. You know, I wondered because I was so young. I don't know, and I never had an opportunity to talk to my parents before they passed away. You know, was it was it something they saw in me? You know, you know like I said, in many cases, I felt like I was the last one to know. And I often wondered, you know, did they see something in me as a child that made them think that, you know, maybe I was different? And that when he, that, that movie wasn't it wasn't the accidental thing about that with Tom with the double feature that was something that maybe they wanted to learn a little more about, but I'll never know. Fascinating. Switching gears a little bit, you worked as a pro dog. Tell us about that. Still do. Um, <laughs> well, in my, um, in my life, my king life, being able to um, accept myself after going out into therapy and stuff and transitioning, uh, I started to regain all that self-esteem and self-respect I had as a child about my accomplishments and things, and no longer felt that there was anything wrong with me. Uh, matter of fact, I felt that you know there's everything right with me. You know, I was brought up about 
you know, uh, with manners and about uh, trust and, I mean, the foundation was there. So I, um, I also learned that in my transition about how you, how you tell people about something is going to have a big bearing on how they accept it. Sure. If you're kind of quiet about, you know, hey, don't tell anybody, but I do this, it's going to be accepted that that must be something that's not going to be good. You're hiding something. But if you openly discuss it, like there's nothing to hide, that people are going to take it a lot more positive. I made the determination when I came out about being trans that the weight of the world felt like it was lifted off my shoulders. So you know something? I'm, I am no longer ever in my life going to carry another burden that I have to carry by choice. So by then I would started learning about the king. I had started um, exploring the outside world of kink. I, I came across some publications in an adult bookstore that was full of ads. And not only did I realize that there were more people out there like me, but I realized that there were people into the same things and that they were out there looking to hook up. So I contacted them, made connections, got to meet them, got, got brought into that world. And, then, and during that time, you didn't have dungeons like Sanctuary or the Lair or Threshold or anything like that. People had play spaces in their home. Yeah. And that, so they were very selective about who they let in their home. It was also something that you, it was still considered bad. It was still considered not socially accepted. So it was, you had to trust people. And that's one thing that I've noticed different about the community then the community then. The community then could be that you could tell somebody in the, in the lifestyle, your deepest dark and secret, and feel confident that it would never be divulged. And these days, it's more like if you tell your deep dark secrets, it's information today and ammunition tomorrow, which is kind of sad to me, but that's a whole other story. But like, uh, okay, on that came part of it. Um, I met people. I uh, was moved into a house in Riverside that was a, a, a DS household. You know, five uh, half acre of land, five bedroom house. They had a play party every second Saturday of the month. And uh, one day, uh, the woman who owned the house said to me, "Oh, I got somebody coming over to do a scene. Would you like to join us?" I was like, "Oh, sure." You know, never going to turn around play. <laughs> and um, so we did this scene. It was a lot of fun. And after it was all over, she handed me some money, and she said, Here, here's part of this for, for that. And I was like, wow, what's this for? And then she explained to me about what co-domination was, that it wasn't about sex, uh, or about everything being consensual, but there were people in, in their life that couldn't share it with, with uh, significant others or anything else, so they'd come to see professionals. Or, they are the type of people that couldn't have marks so they need to come to someone they could be safe or not get into a relationship or somebody's going to fall in love with no strings attached. And I thought, oh my God, you mean I can do this and actually possibly make a living with it? <laughs> and uh, so that kind of spurred it on. And that was, like, and that was another thing my, my family and my, and my dad told me is that um, uh, about using my time wisely. And I've always, I was always brought up about my main focus in life wasn't how much money I could make. It was about the quality of life. Yeah. And Because um, again, it was reinforced to me that I could get hit by a truck tomorrow and it wouldn't mean anything. So you know, live every day of your life happy. Be, be happy. 